shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may do dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, will I sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer my call. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. O God, my, for my Savior, though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses will rise up against me, breathing out violence. I am still confident of, this, confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And that's our scripture reading for today. Children's church? No children's church today. It won't straighten. Sorry. Good morning. Am I on? On? Okay. Let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much to be able to be here in your house and freely worship you. We thank you for your word that has passed the, the t set of time, Father, that it's still as relevant today as it ever was. We thank you for the examples in our life of men who chose to serve only you. Lord, be with us today as we read your word and study. Lord, have your spirit fall upon this place and lead and guide us in the way that we would have uh, you to lead us, Father. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, I want to talk about the rock of my salvation. What do you trust in? Where does your hope lie? What do you love? Those are serious questions. Questions that we need to answer from time to time. Because Satan is a deceiver. He wants to deceive us. He wants to put our faith into things rather than the Creator. He wants to deceive us, to distract us from our calling, from the love of our Father. Even in good things, even when we put our focus on our family or our friends, he wants to deceive us from what God's ultimate purpose is in our life. I was privileged to be able to speak at Lowell's funeral, and I talked about faith, hope, and love. It was an easy thing to talk about. I woke up that morning, and that was what God gave me, because that's the kind of life that Lowell lived. It was so obvious that he had faith, faith in God, not faith in other things, hope that without a shadow of a doubt, he knew where he was going, and love as a result, that he wanted to love others, and we saw that in his life that he wanted to love others because God loved him first, that he wanted to tell others of the love that he had in his heart so that they could have that kind of faith, that kind of hope, and that kind of love. As a result, that's the kind of life that Lowell lived. First thing I thought about when I heard of his passing was, boy, I wish I could have been here. But then immediately God responded to my thoughts and said, you don't have to say goodbye to him. It's just delay delayed hello till you see him again. Because I share that kind of faith. I know that I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly that I'll see my brother. I don't know exactly how that'll happen. That's in God's hands. But I know that it will happen without a doubt. Lowell put his faith in Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 6 through 8 says, So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now the author of Hebrews could have wrote that about Lowell, couldn't he? But he was writing it about another icon of faith. He wrote it from David's words. Jesus is the reason 
for our faith, our hope, and our love. And God poured out His love when He sent Jesus Christ from heaven. Don't forget that. Jesus Christ gave up His deity, came to earth to be a living example for us, to teach us, to show us the way. Not to give us a bunch of do's and don't rules, but to show us how to live as sons and daughters of the true Father. He came because He knew the Father's love for us. And He died for us, fulfilling God's desire to reconcile us through Jesus Christ. Something that we couldn't do on our own. So Jesus did it for us. Psalms 118 verses 4 through 8 is David who is talking here. It says, Let those who fear the Lord say, His love endures forever. When hard pressed I cried to the Lord, He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord to, than to trust or put your confidence in humans or man. But so many times we get distracted and we put our trust in the things of this world, especially as Americans, because we have it so good. God has blessed us so much. But don't forget that all good things come from Him. Don't forget that He has gave us plenty so that we can share that, so that we can tell others of our blessings. He didn't promise an abundant life here on earth of material things. He promised an abundant life through Jesus Christ, that we could live a life of worth, that we could face the things that we cannot face on our own, do mighty things in His power through His Spirit, not for our own well-being, but to proclaim His glory and His honor because He loved us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were in Israel, we visited a place called Masada. And that was the day that I had the privilege to be the tour bus captain. The problem is, I know why they put me as tour bus captain that day. There's not that much to say spiritual about Masada or the Dead Sea. Or at least I thought at first. You know, because I kept thinking, well, I could talk about Nazareth. Or I could talk about Mount of Olives or whatever. But what am I going to say about Masada? Masada is a place of Jewish history. It's not a place that you'll find in the Bible, so to speak. What would I say about the Dead Sea? And the Dead Sea came pretty clearly to me because I started listening to them talk about the abundance of wealth that was coming out of the Dead Sea. Out of a place of death could only God bring life to His people. They said that the economy that came out of the Dead Sea alone with the minerals and things that we need for life was enough to support the country if they had nothing else. So out of death, only God can bring about life. Life for His people, life abundantly. But with Masada, I struggled. When we were taking the tram up, I thought, what a mighty fortress and everything. And they packed us in like sardines. And our um, guide said, do you want to say anything, Alan? I'm like, well, the only thing I've got right now is we're packed in here like sardines. Wouldn't that be great if we're packed together this tight when we go to glory? And I told them to, to remember that and tell others of Jesus Christ so that we could be like this when we're going to glory. There, there's so many people. But I struggled with what to say about Masada because what I saw was a man-made fortress that laid in ruins. And I didn't want to say anything that would offend our Jewish brothers or Hebrews as they call themselves. But what I saw is a people who put their faith in things, in creations, rather than the Creator. And it lay in ruins. Masada comes from the Hebrew word metzuda. It means fortress or stronghold. King Herod built this mighty fortress, King Herod the Great. Don't get him confused because there's several Herods in the Bible and in history. He built magnificent pieces of architecture, cities and everything. When we were at um, Caesarea, he had a huge aqueduct that he had brought in there. And the wonders that he made on Masada were incredible. The temple that he had... His palace overlaid three tiers off the side of the cliff. It was magnificent. And he built this place as his crowning achievement. That when all else failed, if his subjects turned on him, if he didn't have anything to protect him, if he didn't have Rome's backing, if the Jews uprised against him, he would still have this mighty fortress to fall back onto. And he could survive there alone, free from attack, safe from whatever attacked him. But he died because he put his faith in the wrong thing. 
He denied the Messiah. In fact, he tried to kill all the newborn babies just to get rid of Jesus because he didn't want that threat. And he died. He never got to see this fortress protect him. He put his hope in the wrong things. He placed his faith in his might. And we do that sometimes. In things to protect him. In his security. In his power. In this mighty fortress. During the Jewish revolt in AD 68, some Jewish zealots found this place. Rome was attacking Jerusalem and would soon overthrow Jerusalem. Just as prophecy had said, no stone would be un overturned. And the Jews, instead of putting their faith in Jesus, still tried to run and hide and put their faith in other things. And they conquered this fortress from the Roman garrison that was there. And for three years after the fall of Jerusalem, they held off the Romans. They had enough food to survive. They thought they were in a place that was safe. And I've got a video to show you in a little bit. We're not ready yet. But it shows you literally this is a flat rock that sits on, t on top of the Dead Sea Plain there. It's 1,300 feet above the Dead Sea. Its smallest cliffs are 300 to 400 feet straight down. Nothing's going to get to them in that day and age. Of course, today we could use an airstrike or whatever. But in that day... It's pretty futile that anybody was going to get to them. But the Romans pursued them with the most vengeance, in, insane vengeance. Why? Well, the Romans didn't want anybody to be against their authority. But also you've got to remember is this is the people that turned their back on their God. The Romans took their own Jewish counterparts that they took slaves and literally built a ramp coming up to the fortress. And you can see that in some of the pictures it will show. And they thought by using their Jewish counterparts that the Jews that were held up in there wouldn't attack. And they didn't attack them. So they built a ramp straight up. It's magnificent to see. The pictures don't do it justice. But they built a ramp up there and they battered down the doors. Well, these were Roman zealots, which were, I mean, excuse me, Jewish zealots, which were extremists. You might even call them terrorists today. This was the last faction of the Jews that were held up, the last remnant of the Jewish people, the last stand. We have a phrase today, remember the Alamo. And they have a phrase today that the Masada will not fall again. It means that much to them in history. But they're putting their hope in the wrong things. And maybe it was a good thing that I was quiet that day that I didn't have anything to say because I might have said something that was offensive to my brothers and I never would want to do that. But like I said, I saw man's power. And it is magnificent to see, but it still fell. It is nothing compared to God's power. So when the Romans' invasion was imminent, they decided to have a mass murder, basically. Their leader said, we need to kill ourselves so that we won't fall captive to the Romans. It will never be captive again. But what's so ironic there is that all throughout Jewish history, all throughout their scriptures, God says, remember what I did for you. Remember when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember, teach it to your kids. Do not forget, I am the Lord your God. But yet they forgot. Zealot means zealous for God. That's what it means. But ironically, they weren't zealous for God at all, were they? They put their faith in man-made things. A palace, a fortress that was built by another man who put his faith in in the wrong things. So they decided to kill themselves. So they selected ten officers that would kill everyone there. And then out of those ten officers, one was picked that would kill the rest. But there were a few women and children that hid and survived to go on and tell the story. For nearly 1900 years, Masada was forgot about. Because there was no Jewish people. They had been dispersed all over the land. But as Israel became a nation again, they brought up this site as history. They found out, which they knew, they reconstructed what happened there. Maybe it was an honorable thing, maybe it wasn't an honorable thing. But they still rely today on man's might. That this was one last stand. But God said all throughout His Scriptures, remember that I am the Lord your God. I am your fortress. I am your strength. I am your deliverer. What would have been different maybe if they put their faith in God, if they were zealous for God? 
rather than for man-made security. So it was a place of destruction, just like the Dead Sea. And that day, like I said, I was just quiet. I didn't have much to say. But I kept looking and kept taking it all in and saying, wow, this is such a mighty place in man's eyes. But yet it still lays in ruins. There were black lines where they had reconstructed some of the walls to show you where the wall was torn down, but now you build it back. And you couldn't really even tell a difference where that began and the other started. But what I saw was, like I said, a people that refused the coming of Jesus Christ, that refused Him as a Messiah, and they lost the protection of God. He was clear that if you obey my commands, if you teach your children, then I, the Lord your God, will give to you this land. I will supply your needs. I will be the rock of your salvation. You cannot put your faith, hope, and love into created things. Created things cannot be your security or your stronghold. They will not protect you. So I ask you again, what do you trust in? Where do your hopes lie? What do you love? Serious questions to think about. And yes, you should love your family and friends. But ultimately, you should put your saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was probably a good thing, like I said, that I didn't have anything to say that day. It's a God thing. I studied and I studied and I studied with what to say. My phone battery went down to nearly nothing because I kept Googling everything I could read about Masada and what I was going to say. But you know, that's not the way it works. I can't put God in a box. He gives me what to say and when to say it. And He just kept my mouth shut that day till later in the day because I didn't want to say anything that might offend my Jewish friends. They were good people, but they called themselves Hebrews on purpose. They didn't want to be associated with Jews in their faith They didn't want to be associated with Christians in their faith. They were just men, Hebrews, who understood the history of the land, but didn't understand the spirituality. They did not understand what it meant for being zealous for God. Do you have that video ready? This is an aerial view from a drone, because we have drones now, of Masada. That's the ramp that they built leading up to it. And that's the three-tiered palace. One of the places in Israel, too, that you'll find that's not built over and over and over. Because all of the other areas, Jerusalem especially, 
have been turned over from one nation to another, and they just build on top of the rubble. This hasn't been built upon at all. And to me, I find that kind of spiritual. Because here it is, the rock of their salvation, which led to their demise, didn't it? Because they built the rock of their salvation on the wrong thing. They didn't build it on their faith in God. Even like I said, the term zealot means zealous for God. But they didn't have the faith in God that they needed. They didn't remember His words. If you look on the back of your bulletin, you'll see a bunch of rocks stacked into the picture of a cross. And you'll see some of the words that our God, our Lord is. It says, I am the Lord of lords, anointed one, redeemer, the way, cornerstone, prince of peace, light of, world, of the world, lamb of God. And those are just a few. This is what we're supposed to remember. This is what we're supposed to put our strength in. And you'll see that all of them are configured in the cross where we saw the love of God made manifest to His people, to His children, because He loved them so much that He would send His only Son to redeem them back to Himself. Masada, like I said, was nearly forgot about for many years. And today it's a sign of Jewish freedom, but they're still not seeing the Messiah. They're still not seeing to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and He is the only way. Looking back at King David, in Psalm 27, verses 1 through 5, he said this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will never fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I may ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. For in the day of trouble He will keep me safe in His dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of His sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Verse 14, wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart, wait for the Lord. That's all they had to do was remember Scripture. These guys were trained up and memorized the first five books of the Bible. They were zealous for God, but yet they forgot what He said. It's just like if you teach your son now all these instructions and he walks away forgetting everything you say. They forgot who their God was. And David is a perfect example for us because he's sinner extraordinaire, isn't he? He wasn't a perfect man. We see all throughout the, uh, the Word of God, we see his failures. We see a man who did unthinkable sins, but yet we read that he was a man after God's own heart. Because even though he sinned, and we all sin and fall short of God's glorious standard, he realized who God was. He put his faith in God. That scripture that we just read sounds just like the event on Masada. Just like it. In 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 through 5, David was fearing for his life from Saul. And he went to a place, a stronghold. Maybe it was Masada. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. All those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, the lowest of the low, the ones that had no hope. And he became their commander, commander of a ragtag team, right? About 400 men were with him. From there David went to Mizpah in Moab, and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come to st and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? He was on a learning process. So he left them with the king of Moab. And they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold. Now that word is a Hebrew word. It's Matsuda. It sounds a lot like, and it's the same word that we get Masada from. It means fortress, defense, or stronghold. But the prophet Gad said to Dave, do not stay in the stronghold. Now if you notice just prior to that, it says, 
until I learn what God will do for me. God was telling him, you can't stay in man's stronghold, even if it is on top of this mighty fortress, even if you have enough water, even if you have enough men, anything to protect you. I am the rock of your salvation. I am your protector, and I am your strength. That's 1 Samuel 22. Ironically, if you turn to 2 Samuel 22, you'll see David's song of victory. I don't know if it took him a whole chapter to figure it out or if he knew it all along, but it's 2 Samuel 22, verses 1 through 10. It says, David sang to the Lord the words of this song. When the Lord delivered him, not when his mighty fortress, not when his men, but the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. All of his enemies. That's what God can do for you. He said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I shall take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold my refuge, and my Savior. From violent people you save me. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise and have been saved from my enemies. The waves of death swirled around me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of the grave coiled around me. The snares of death confronted me. And he didn't choose suicide. He chose faith in God. In my distress, I called to the Lord, I called to my God. From His temple He heard my voice, my cry came to His ears. The earth trembled and quaked, the foundation of the heavens shook. They trembled because He was angry. Smoke rose from His nostrils, consuming fire came from His mouth. Burning coals blazed out of it. He parted the heavens and came down. I don't know about you, but if I'm alone on this rock fortress and I see impending death... That's who I want fighting on my side. I don't want to commit suicide. I don't want to rely on my strength. I want to rely on the Lord my God, who Scripture tells me provides me with everything that I need, every want, every desire. He is my strength. He is my rock, my redeemer, my comforter. And Scripture tells me to remember that and teach it to my children. That's who I want on my side. You cannot be more faithful than God. So put your faith in Him and in Him alone. So I ask the question again, what do you trust in? Where do your hopes lie? What do you love? Because we do get deceived so many times and misdirected. We do fall short. And all we've got to do is say, Father, forgive me. Come, and He will hear our cries, and He will come. All we have to re do is repent, and He is the one that will be faithful. He's the one that provides the way of escape. He will gladly come so that you can take shelter in Him. He will protect you and save you. The Jews put their hope in things, and they were destroyed. They were warned all throughout Scriptures to remember to put their faith in God, to teach their children never to forget what the Lord their God had done for them. And so quickly they forget. And we read Scripture and say, how could they do that? But in our own lives we do the exactly the same things. So where will you be when your hope that's in your family, in your friends, in your marriage, in your possessions, in your job, even in your health, where will you be when all that is taken away from you? Will you cry out to God? Will He be your faith? Or will you try to turn to some other substitute? God is our only strength in the times of troubles and in the times of plenty. Don't forget that. If you put your faith in other things, it will lay in ruin. It will be destroyed. David had a son. His name was Solomon. And when he was dying, he told Solomon these instructions. These are from 1 Chronicles 28, verses 8 through 10. So now I charge you in the sight of all Israel and of the assembly of the Lord and in hearing of our God, be careful to follow all the commands of the Lord your God that you may possess this good land and pass it on as an inheritance to your descendants forever. 
And you, my son Solomon, acknowledge the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every desire and every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. Don't forget that. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. Consider now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house as a sanctuary. Be strong and do the work. And oh, how much more we are called to do that today. Jesus Christ was sent to reconcile the world back to God. And He called us as ambassadors. He called us to be His hands and feet. He called us to be the light of the world. So oh, how much more do we have a, a duty to build upon that. So that others may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. And they need to see that in the times of our trouble and distress as much as they need to see that in our times of fortune. Will you serve Him with all of your heart? Will you serve Him over other idols? As your tour bus pastor today, I challenge you to answer those questions that I asked you. To get right with God. To let Him be the true rock of your salvation. Not to rely on the things. The things that He has created are marvelous things. And they're things that show His glory and show who He is. Not things that should be worshipped. Like I said, when I stood up top there, I said, Wow, what a beautiful place this is that God has created. This could be a mighty stronghold. But we've got to remember that our stronghold is God. And like I said, I just kept my mouth shut that day. If I get a chance to go back, I don't know what I'll say then. We'll just have to see how the Spirit leads me. But I didn't want to offend my brothers, and I didn't know enough about the history. And they spoke the history as it was a magnificent thing that they committed suicide. And I just can't see that in everything I look at. Because all they had to do instead of commit suicide was say, Lord, we cry out to you as our father David did. You've given us these promises. We call upon you to be faithful and true. But instead they said, let's murder one another. I can't find that as anything that would give me any hero heroism. heroism. I find it sad. David also said in Psalm 18 verses 1 and 2, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, he sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hands of all his enemies and from the hands of Saul. He said, I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, the same Hebrew word, Matsudah, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and my horn, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. If God is these things, why do we need anything else? Everything else is just icing on the cake that, our, that God already gave us through Jesus Christ. Psalm 31, 1 through 6 says, In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, he knew that he was, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. If you put all of your faith in God, it will lead to hope that has no shadow of a doubt. You will learn to love others and hate idols, as this verse says, because you will be relying on God's strength and His might. He is everything. I am nothing. And until we discover that, we can't truly live the kind of life that He has called us to live. So I ask you to examine yourselves, to look at the words of David, to look at the examples of the Jews and decide who you will put your faith in. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your love. Lord, we need no one else, no other rock but you. 
And we thank You so much for sending Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Lord, I thank You that He was willing to lay down His life for us. And I just praise His name. For worthy is the Lamb, and worthy is the Father. We come to You through His name, through the precious blood of Jesus, we come to You, Father. Amen.